Okay, hi Tony. Hello everybody. We are back with part three of this exploration through the transformational beauty, I guess, or power of 12 steps of AA. And I'll just to transition to today from the last part two, we did, we finished around step eight, which was made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. And we're going to move on sort of to the next part of that, which is step nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. So Tony, maybe you can just start off with your understanding, I guess, or experience of how you went through the step eight process and carried it into step nine. Thanks, Mike. Hi, everybody again. And um, yeah, I, at my home group meeting, we, we just discussed step nine. So this is a really apropos place to be with, with all of this. And, you know, for me, step eight and nine, they were, and, and this is what I shared at my home group, I was just thinking back my first time going through the process of the 12 steps and, you know, as, as desperate and as willing as I was at that time and, and really desired change, this was something that was completely foreign to me. This concept of, you know, a, admitting a wrongs, number one, like we just never did that. I, I don't think I've ever, ever heard anybody in my, in particularly my family of origin, do this, like just to sort of admit where you were, where they're wrong, you know, like, I mean, I grew up in a, an era of blame and shame and guilt and uh, other focus, like it was always somebody else's fault. You know, everything that happened was because of something they did. It was never about what I did or what I could do to make this right or better just just never heard of it and uh, I think largely you know in my experience I can't say for the entire world because I don't know I mean it just seems like in my experience of people that I have met both inside and outside of recovery this is not a process that human beings do it's just not something we're socialized or educated or conditioned to to doing, and at least in my experience. Now that I've learned over the years, <laughs> it's quite narrow. I mean, I'm pretty open-minded today, but met a lot of different people, but I, I haven't really, I mean, not that we've had really deep conversations, but this, uh, the people that I have talked with, it's not something that just it isn't practiced, particularly with men. Uh, so, you know, when it came to steps eight and nine, um, you know, when I had a pretty clear understanding of my part. So that was, I think, the hardest part was really understanding what my part was and truly what my wrongs were. Um, and to own them, like really to own them. I'm a people pleaser by nature. I, I can manipulate very well by nature. I know the right things to say. I know how to strategize and, and you know, say what people want to hear. I know how to do that. This, I didn't really want to do that, although there was natural tendencies for me to want to say the right things to appease my sponsor. You know, I mean, like my sponsor at the time was no nonsense. I mean, it was like, this is what you do if you want to work with me. And anyhow, it was pretty, pretty strict. And I get it, you know, because these principles and concepts are not easy to embrace. So, particularly with my family, those were the more difficult ones. Those were the ones where there was a lot of damage and a lot of wreckage to be cleared. And I had not spoken with my family at that time for about seven years. I had moved to Toronto, they're from Windsor and there was a lot of stuff. Anyhow, the long and the short of it is I hadn't at this point, um, this would have been probably around, uh, 2001, I think it was, I had just gone to my first international convention in Minneapolis, and I was completely and utterly touched by the hand of God at this experience. 
And I had another real surrender that really deepened my commitment to the program and to the, the spiritual journey of the 12 steps. Got this particular sponsor and went on the journey. We went through the process fairly quickly. So it would have been around 2001. And I remember it was around Mother's Day. Well, it was actually the day when we went to Windsor for me to make amends with my family, particularly my mom and my dad, was on Mother's Day that year. And that is really serendipitous because if anyone understands the origins of Alcoholics Anonymous and AA, Bill Wilson, one of the co-founders, um, he sobered up on Mother's Day in 1934, I believe it was. And then in 1935 is when he reached out to Bill, like he wanted to, anyhow, so I think it was Mother's Day the year before. So, um, and, you know, I didn't really understand that initially, but I remember, you know, when I, when I got sober, when I committed to AA this time, there were all these voices in my head and thought I was going crazy. I thought I was losing my mind and, you know, but the voices were very specific and, you know, asking me, have I had enough yet? You know, I don't have to live like this way anymore. All I need to do is follow this way. And it just it was very specific saying the same thing over and over. You know, I don't know. I don't know where these voices, I thought it was, you know, God speaking to me and could have been Bill, <laughs> Bill Wilson, you know, his spirit coming to me. I don't know. But it, anyhow, it's kind of serendipitous that it was on Mother's Day that I went and made amends with my family and took this big spiritual leap of faith, you know? And, you know, makes, it gets me choked up inside when I think about it. When I think of the, the perfectness of, of how things went in my recovery, when I just had that complete willingness and surrender. Now, I'm not saying I never balked, because I did, but I had a lot of surrender in me at that time. And I really, I really wanted to change my life. And, I remember going down to Windsor and I, I, everything was erupting in me. Like there was just so much clarity in my, in my wrong and, and what I had done and how much I must have hurt them in my family. Like all these times, all these years, it was always about what they did to me. I could never see what I had done to them clearly. Or if I did, it was it dismissed as quickly as I could. You know, I never really sat with it. I never really, I really never owned it. And, uh, you know, I remember going down there just in the car because it's about a four hour drive and all this shame was coming up. And, and, and I think I was really afraid too because like, I didn't know what was going to happen. You know, I hadn't spoken to them in seven years, just kind of fantasizing about what, what the scenario was going to look like. And, Anyhow, um, they were just so happy to see me. I mean, you know, my parents hadn't seen me in seven years. I don't know. They probably thought I was dead. I don't know what they thought. I can't imagine what must have gone, what, what that must have put them through. Anyhow, it was a really happy reuniting. And um, they were not prepared for what I was going to do. They just knew I was coming to see them. And, you know, the, that day, you know, I sat them down. The whole family was there. And I did what, and it says this in the big book, is to do more of a general amends. Just had everybody there, sat them all at the kitchen table and just kind of outed it and explained what I was doing. And, you know, um, didn't really get into a whole lot of specifics, but just, you know, really with a real heartfelt, shared with them, you know, how sorry I was for what I put them through, that these weren't just words like, you know, um, I really, and my intention is to follow it through with action, but I feel I needed to make a start here. Um, and I think they could see that there was some sincerity and, and some real desire to amend the relationships and that I was prepared. And you know, and that was the beginning, and it wasn't really emotional for me. Um, I know for a lot of people it is, but it wasn't for me. It was just like, you know, I just, but I think what the real wonderful thing of that experience was in actually making those amends with my family was to, you know, it wiped the slate clean. It really completely wiped it clean 
all of that resentment and bitterness and hostility and, um, you know, resentment, there was such deep resentment, particularly towards my mom and my dad, you know, for, you know, I don't know, I just blame them, you know, and I realized today, like, you know, I just grew up in an environment where they didn't, you know, they did a lot of things right, but I wasn't looking at that for some reason. I was just looking at what they did wrong and what they were able to give me and, you know, all this stuff. And I realized today that they just did not have it to give. You know, my father never got it. He, you know, he just, you know, they, these things like, like I feel so blessed to have found the, these beautiful 12 steps and this way of living and everything because it has shown me, you have shown me the ability to live rightly and differently you know but it's unfortunate i had to really burn my life down to the ground in order for me to find this you know but i don't think most people just stumble across this way of life you know um and i wish they did because it you know i think if this world operated a little bit more in terms of the principles that we learn in the 12 steps i really i really really feel and believe in my heart and soul we would have such a better world to live in um and it's a good world. I mean, I don't want to just, you know, say that, it, you know, I just think, you know, what we experience in the fellowship is just such a beautiful thing. And it would be wonderful if that could be shared more openly in the world. And so, so that was with my family and those were the big ones. And then it was just like referring back to the list, you know, just kind of, cause you know, the, the, the process is, is we become willing to make amends to them all. You know, and then there, so there are people that, you know, are gone that I'm never going to see again that have died, you know, so those people, you know, I did letters, I, I wrote letters, um, if it's sort of like if I stole money from them or whatever, and I want to make like a monetary amend, I can, I, I donate to charities, you know, so, for example, you know, one of, of my family, I stole, like, I, I stole a lot from everybody, but, you know, this particular family member um you know I just felt like you know I wasn't there when she died I was absent it let me feel left me feeling really guilty inside for not being there and you know there's nothing I can do about it so like I mean my way of sort of honoring her memory and showing my commitment is you know I I donate to the charity that took her life because she died of of a stroke so I donate to the stroke society and um stuff like that so there are things that we can do you know I went to her grave and wrote a letter and you know just sort of admitted all these things to her and you know and that was really emotional and my mom took me to the grave and you know and so there's ways of doing it and I think there's um you know with my friends there's not all of them have been received well most have been um you know I was a pretty big piece of work and pretty selfish and self-centered and, and hurt a lot of people. And there's some people that's just don't want to have anything to do with me. They cannot let it go. And that's fine. You know, I don't, I tried, you know, I tried to make peace. I tried to do what I can, you know, um, there, you know, and, and there, there comes a point where, you know, sometimes you just got to let it go and just let, let it go and it would be nice but you know you can't control what others do or don't do right so and so I don't want to force myself too much because that can mean me being controlling and somebody doesn't want it it's fine you know that's their prerogative that is their right um but the amends process was a really powerful healing process that was I think that's what really sealed the deal from those transformational steps steps four to nine is really what we call the transformational steps those are the ones that really give us that initial transformation and that truly happened to me the only way i can describe it and then there's an analogy we use in some of the language of the big book is that you know your slate is completely wiped clean it's like they call them wipers like it's like almost like that part of my life never really existed stuff that I carried so deeply in my soul. Not that it's all gone. Don't get me wrong. It's there are residuals of other abuses and things that happen, particularly in childhood. I'm realizing today that still needs some attention. Um, 
but the stuff that, you know, as an adult where I sort of was more, I guess, uh, had more, I don't like to use the word control, but I had some ability to, to write and to amend. Um, so there's like some more deep seated stuff in terms of, um, you know, uh, like developmental trauma and stuff that I think needs a little bit more attention. Um, I don't know, I'm exploring it right now. There's a lot of stuff, you know, I was one of those people that, I don't know what you want to call it. I've heard people say I was blessed to have these things happen, you know, because uh, it gives us an ability to work the program. I don't know that I would call it blessed, but I'm just trying to think of it as opportunity and ability to lean into the program, you know, um, ability and opportunity to understand my higher powers will for me ability and, and, and an attitude of gratitude around everything that happens, not just the good things, you know? So I used to think that it had to be good in order to be God's will. It had to feel good in order to be God's will. And I heard it said some time ago that everything is God's will, you know? All the ugly stuff, all the goods, like everything. There's no like, you know, just because you're a good boy and you're going to get good things, you know, I mean, so I'm trying to embrace the tough stuff, you know, the stuff, the challenges that life brings, because ironically, Mike, that's the stuff that really gets me to lean into my higher power. It's not the stuff that feels good. It's the stuff that hurts. It's the stuff that brings suffering and discontentment into my life, you know, so I'm grateful, you know, that I have steps. Um, so part of my amends to myself, um, which we don't hear a lot of, and I learned this concept actually when I started to uh, attend Al-Anon meetings, because there is a big, there's a big emphasis on that. I know there's a lot of people in, in the AA rooms that don't believe that, you know, it's all about getting out of self and not not embracing yourself in that way. I, I kind of disagree with it because I think for me, uh, nobody hurt Tony more than Tony. You know, I understand this today. My hand was the hand that stuck needles in my arm and put, poured the booze down my throat and did all these terrible things. Like that was me. I did that to me, you know? I did things to my body that no, and I let people do things to my body. That was me. That was me. You know, that victim mode of mindset that I had is gone. I understand that today. You know, I was incomplete. Um, you know, I mean, there were times that it was sort of like out of my mind, but I was the one that said yes to everything. You know, it wasn't like anybody, you know, well, it's not that they didn't for, but you know, anyhow, I don't want to get into all that. But for most of it, it was, you know, I was a willing participant in my life, right? So I have to own that. So doing things like getting my criminal record cleared and getting a pardon and, and doing all that stuff were all things that I did to make amends to myself, you know, to clean up the wreckage of my past, to exercise self-compassion, you know, to be self-loving, to be self-caring to take care of my body, to eat nicer foods, more nutritious foods, but when I can, you know, to get proper sleep, to just not do harmful things to my body anymore. I quit smoking years ago. Like that was all part of my step nine work. Um, to try to treat my poor liver <laughs> with love and compassion. That poor little guy, what that thing must have been through, you know, with me putting all that stupidness into my body, you know all that stuff, right? Going and seeking outside help, doing therapy, you know, acting on my cancer treatments fairly quickly, not neglecting my body. You know, all that stuff is all part of step nine work and, and exercising self-compassion and self-love. Um, I'm taking, I'm pretty much decided on moving towards taking a program because it was recommended to me in my trauma course that I did a few years, it was about three years ago that I did it now, um, to follow up with, uh, it's, you know, there's a couple of agencies in Toronto that specifically work on sexual childhood trauma, you know, um, 
because I think that stuff is really deep seated. You know, that's where I really, you know, the walls were constructed really thickly and, you know, there was a lot of damage done and, you know, trust was broken and boundaries were, you know, completely obliterated, you know, and, and when a lot of that stuff happens developmentally, it, it's really, I think it's hard coded in my neural pathways and sometimes it needs a little extra support and, and I'm okay with that today. There was a time in my life that I didn't really, I couldn't say that, but I think, you know, draw on whatever support you can. There's a wealth of support out there. It's not all 12 step, but I think indirectly it's interwoven with what we do in the 12 steps and it's fine. So um, that's all stuff that I'm doing for my, my self healing and, um, you know, making amends to myself and to do that sort of stuff. Um, so, um, you know, and uh, so the step nine process, you know, for me back then in those early days, and there's, you know, it's kind of like ongoing, but initially it took about a year to sort of get everybody and everything done, the financial amends, uh, you know, there's, a, there was a lot, right, you know, it's a lot, I came here like, yeah, very broken, so, so, uh, you know, and, and I think the most beautiful part of it is it really helps to alleviate guilt. I think the purpose, you know, I really feel the purpose is largely to break down selfishness and self-centeredness and to fit us to be of maximum service to others and to God. And I, I get that, but I think it, that process is done through the breaking down of self-will and guilt and, and shame, you know, uh, largely with guilt. I didn't understand how much guilt plagued me, how much I had internalized as being wrong and bad. Um, and that stemmed from a little boy, you know, when all this stuff was going on. And although I didn't have the mental cognition to understand, there was just all of this powerlessness that, you know, really damaged and put me into a lot of denial, a lot of fantasy, a lot of make-believe, and a, a compulsive need to avoid and obsess and, and, um, and yeah, all that stuff. So like, I feel for me, it started very early. You know, I say in my Al-Anon talk that I came from a normal alcoholic upbringing, you know, it was all around me, you know, it's all around me. I see it now, it's, it's just alcoholism, you know, in it's many forms looks a lot like uh, mental illness and various things. Uh, it's a spiritual malady I call alcoholism that worms its way into our, the lives of people that don't even pick up a drink. You know, I don't know if anybody has been to Al-Anon, but oh my God, you know, you go to these meetings and you see they suffer with the very same thing and they don't even drink, you know? So it, that's just goes to show you the power of this disease and how it can infiltrate the minds of children, how it twists them, you know? And uh, just like for me, you know, it got to me when I was a little boy. And just, and then I became, you know, infected and affected with alcoholism. I mean, I think it's a family multi-generational thing, you know, intergenerational trauma, all that sort of stuff. So is there anything you want to ask me? I, I can just keep going and going, you know me, Mike. <laughs> yeah, no, I. <laughs> I wasn't partly it was just nice to listen to you and now I'm just going to pause because my children are making a lot of noise in the background oh, are they? Okay. I'm yeah. going to go ask them to shut up for a minute here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> I'm oh. all right I'll resume that yeah there was I had a that interaction I had with Gabor Mate he said a very similar thing to what you just said is just we're not our parents. Now we have like our kids are lucky that their parents are practicing principles in their affairs to reduce the passing on of the isms. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's wonderful. And so I do, I, I guess I forget that too sometimes. I forget that. Uh, I'm not perfect, nor should I be. It's okay to make mistakes. And actually, on that note, I wanted to, one of the first things you said around step um, 
eight and nine is this, what is our part, right? We're not, this isn't about anyone else. This is about us. And it's the, I, maybe it's the, you mentioned four through nine are sort of these really transforming processes where we kind of clean out the inside of our own yuckiness and then we get to try to make peace with the world and other people through eight and nine to the best of our ability and as you mentioned at the very beginning nobody well it's very rare that you see people who are willing to acknowledge their mistakes it's exactly. like so part of it i think for sure is our unconscious sense of fear there's like there's a a narrative going on in our lower brain lizard brain whatever you want to call it amygdala mm -hmm. that says if i admit my inadequacy or if i admit that i did something wrong i won't be safe and if i'm not safe then everything falls apart and then i'm a loner or that no one will love me so there's this underlying tone of fear and insecurity at the bottom of all of our consciousness in some sense our reality that gets in the way of us acting ethically and taking responsibility for our behavior and on that note on, as a parent and i think I had a conversation recently with somebody where they were worried about bringing a baby into the world. So, cause they didn't want to screw them up. Like their parents had screwed them up kind of thing. And the reminder is inevitably we're going to screw up our kids in one way or another. That's the, that's the stamp you get from the universe when you come out of the womb. <laughs> You're going to be messed up one way or another. It's your parents' job to make sure that happens. And then it's your job to fix it, basically, or to deal with it. And when we have these principles and when we can show them what it looks like to acknowledge a wrong and to make amends for it is really that's the practice that's the, what we're learning and so it's not so much as parents again we're or just as people we're going to make mistakes we're going to hurt other people's feelings that's not so much what matters what matters is what we do then or after that has happened and that's where the steps for me the biggest amends i had to make was with my wife about some things I had been lying to her about. But I wasn't able to do that until I had gone through all the other steps because I didn't, I wasn't, that sense of insecurity and shame and guilt and all of that stuff that you mentioned as well, until I had healed that to, to a certain extent, I wasn't ready to start making amends and that's that piece of most people are still so trapped in this self-centered fear that if i acknowledge that i did something wrong or that i'm weak or whatever then my sense of self or my ego or my death my fear of death really at the core gets triggered and then of course i'll defend that to the end so the first piece i just want to read it again here may direct amends to such people wherever possible. That I think it's important to clarify that that is one side of it that's often discussed. And we do that with humility and integrity and discernment. And then the other side is, except when to do so would injure them or others. And that's a really big one. I also don't think it's discussed very, very often. A lot of the time, I think, 
somebody was telling me the other day there's a Seinfeld episode of somebody going through the steps and they want to run around New York City making amends and shouting out all their wrongs, which is pretty amusing. I got to see it. I haven't seen it. But that that that's common for people in recovery is they just think, oh, I'm sober. I'm free. I want to go running around shouting out all the things I've done. And, and I think it's important that we realize sometimes that desire to let it all out is more self-serving than it is of serving of others. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that's that, that last part of step nine, except when to do so would injure them or others. And I remember, I guess I was integrating that idea or learning what that actually meant for me. And I think a lot of it was, I just want to absolve myself of this guilt and shame that I feel from these horrible things I've done. Yet that's a self-serving desire because had I really expressed maybe or admitted some of those things it actually would have caused so much more suffering than it was serving to learn to forgive myself and process it myself so it was almost as if i was trying to release my own shame and guilt guilt onto others so i didn't have to deal with it um and i think that was a hard lesson for me to learn but a very important one um and and another thing I think about step eight and nine, that's really important is the idea of a living amends as well, which is, I think it says in, in the literature somewhere, the day we sober up, we start almost our living amends. And part of a living amends for me was simply not acting in the way that I acted before so that I didn't have to make amends for the things that I continued or that I had done in the past. And that, that's an interesting one as well. And I think helpful to understand that amends, that was the one other thing I wanted to clarify. An apology is not an amends, right? An apology might be part of an amends, but a, an apology is simply stating what we have done wrong. An amends is, repairing yeah or practicing all the principles that we've learned thus far so that we no longer continue those behaviors that contribute to us needing to make another amends and that's a much harder task and one that people it's so much easier to just say i'm sorry that's why with kids i, I rarely oh i just it's so habitual that adults just tell kids to say sorry, say sorry, say sorry, say sorry. But it's just, that's almost <laughs> the easy way out. <laughs> it's, it's much more effective to encourage people to understand why they did what they did so that they may reduce the likelihood of doing it again. Therefore, they don't need to keep apologizing. So that I think is a big one. And then you see it all. I am caught up. My brain's being hacked by the, the news media these days or I'm allowing it to be hacked because I, get, I have noticed myself getting caught up in sort of self-righteous arrogance that our politicians, our news media people, everyone is so arrogant and self-centered and never in their minds would they conceive of acknowledging that they did something wrong and it is just so difficult for me to handle right now and i'm really trying to practice well this is what i'm saying Mike. yeah it, it, the world in many ways teaches us to be self-serving i mean that's what is inbred you know the competitive yeah. self-serving yeah. way of being the best and you know i think there's although it does a lot of good you know brings quality I, there's i think there's a detrimental side to you know those of us who have you know uh, the darker natures right uh, you know and 
I don't know. I, I mean, I see it. I see it in the world. And, you know, I, and that's what I was saying. Like, I think if, if more of this philosophy is inbred into us uh, in our education system somehow, teaching us, and, but it's the spirituality is such a personal thing. You know, you can't really, yeah, I don't know. I don't know that there's a way to actually teach it, you know, because it's so closely aligned with religion. And we've gotten into such a way of, of removing anything to do with religion or spirituality out of everything, you know, because, you know, every sort of has their own belief system, right? So there's, I don't know, I think it's just challenging, but I'm just glad that I, that I have some ability to process um, and, and rely on, you know, so that when I make decisions, they're not totally self-serving or selfish. Not always, but at least I can reflect it with people and, right. you know, get their feedback. And I don't know, but, but they're they're operating, you know, like you think of our leaders that are running a country, and you know they get it from. <laughs> They get attacked from all angles, right? Like it's easy for me to sit there and say this where I don't have to deal with this sort of thing, right? True. Only true, imagine true. what these people have to deal with on a daily basis. The attacks. It's a very you know. nice reminder. Yeah. 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 And I think that's an in some way for me, that's a good segue into step 10 here. Mm -hmm. Continued to take personal inventory. And when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. I have a good I mean, you spoke the perfect words there. In the past week, I've had two instances in which I completely, as we say in the program sometimes, our intentions are good, our methods are flawed. I had an argument with my mother and father-in-law about Joe Rogan, <laughs> who's come into a media storm. And I got so, I got angry, I got defensive, I got triggered by the patterns of my past with my mom, you know, and it just was not, it wasn't the person, it, I just, I behaved in a way that wasn't in alignment with my desired behavior so i didn't say anything that i really wouldn't have said but i was angry defensive and frustrated and i behaved that way so it wasn't pleasant for anyone around us it wasn't terrible but it just wasn't nice and then because the program just haunts me in a good way <laughs> Within an hour, I was able to go up to my mom and give her a hug and just say that wasn't, I I just gave her a hug, said, I love you. And then I, the next day I called my father-in-law, I called her again, and I just simply was able to apologize for how I behaved. And that's what we learn in the program. And, and that's in some sense, continuing to take personal inventory. And when we're wrong, promptly admitted it. I think the house cleaning helps us let go of the lingering shame and guilt that gets in the way of us making amends or acknowledging our behavior. So it gets, it, it's a lot easier for me to do that now. And I can't live with myself until I do. So that's a nice thing. Um, but yeah, that's my little speech on step 10. I'm curious how that looks like for you or how you practice that. Well, thanks for sharing that, Mike. That's, uh, that's a good, good uh, description of, of what we do with step 10 and how we work the step. And yeah, like I, I've got it. I've got the big book open to that part of the page mm. on 84. And like, I just like to share with you what it says. It says, you know, suggests that we continue to take a personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. We vigorously commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past. We have entered the world of the spirit. Our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. This is not an overnight matter. 
It should continue for our lifetime. Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. When these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. Did you do that, Mike? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, we discuss them with someone immediately, and we make amends quickly if we have harmed anyone. Then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Love and tolerance of others is our code. I'm, I don't always do that. That's the part of step 10 that I fail miserably at. That's why I asked you, you know, because that's, so as soon as it crops up, right? Like as soon yeah, as yeah. that yeah. thought or that resentment or that yeah. as soon as it crops up, it says we ask our higher power to remove yeah. it, right? And then we discuss it with someone immediately, right? Yeah, so, I did call my sponsor. Oh, you I did? did? Call, okay. Yeah, oh, I did, yeah. I did, yeah. Right. yeah. 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 So that's, I mean, I don't always do that. Like a lot of times stuff will crop up like at the workplace, for example, like I'm yeah. not really in a position where I can, anyhow, that, uh, what, what I'm saying is, is I fail miserably at it, you know, of, of in the moment to with this, cause that is step 10, right? Is in when it crops up, when these defects present them in my life, if I'm becoming judgmental, cynical, I think all the, that list that I read you, uh, in there, there had to have been about maybe 40 of them in there of, of mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. glaring defects that I have, which can be sub summed up into those four, selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. Because that's those are the, the, the major buckets. Right. And then all those other ones are kind of offshoots of those big ones, right? So um, anyhow, that's the practice, right? That's the practice. That's what I'm asked to do. And, you know, I guess in the spirit of transparency, like self-reliance has been probably my, my biggest demon. You know, I, I just grew up with a lot of shame, a lot of guilt, a lot of like stuffing it in, pushing it down, you know, figure it out on your own. Don't ever ask any, don't appear a fool like you don't know, right? And I think to a large extent, that's the world we live in. They want you to know stuff. You know, you, you don't just say, I don't know, you know, and uh, anyhow, so that still haunts me and plagues me to this day of like, not really having that willingness to just in the moment, you know, and it's not like, I want to call my sponsor or somebody up every little thing. Yes. But, you know, I think sometimes you need to do it, right? I mean, my, my thing, this is my go-to, I enforce things with my will. And then when my will isn't working and then when it's failing me miserably, then I'll turn and ask somebody to help. Me. <laughs> That's kind of how I roll, right? <laughs> so this is asking me to stop that. Stop, right. stop doing right, that, right? right. Yeah. Become yeah. more reliant on a higher power, you know? And it's challenging, right? So, but it I'm is. much better at it. I really am. I mean, I, I, I have like a, you know, a recovery friend group and, the way that I, you know, try to work with my sponsees is, you know, try to have like a family where we have an interdependence, you know, yeah. so it's not them just always coming to me or me just going to my spot, but we're doing this together, you know, we're just if, recovering alcoholics and addicts, sharing experience, strength and hope. There's no hierarchy, you know, and I try to instill that in them. Uh, because I didn't come from that kind of sponsorship line initially. It was like, there was a definite hierarchy. You know, there was a definite obedience to your sponsor, you know, and, you know, for me either, that really made me afraid a lot of the times, you know, to, to expose vulnerability. I didn't have that sense of safety that I was seeking where I could just go. And so I try to do things a little bit differently. So making it feel safe all around so yeah. that we can share with each other and, and be open and honest because I really feel like the journey is about honesty yes. right and yes. You know, yes part of cleaning it's, up the past is is all about that it is yeah and I just on that note I think what is so important for me and I think this is a good description of how the self-centered fear shame guilt works is it wants to hide and so 
my unhealthy behavior is to hide and not acknowledge what's going on inside of me. So when I can, this is why the literally hundreds of hours I've spent on the phone with my sponsor and others in the program, to me, I think was the most healing is because when I say it out loud to another human being and to God for that matter, or my higher power, I can't lie to myself about it. And I think that's a huge one for me, which is why it's so important that we get out of our head and connect with others is it's a way of practicing honesty and smashing our self-deception or our, our lying to ourself. And so just when I say it out loud to somebody else, it's so soothing and helps me get perspective and avoid hiding and lying to myself and that just it doesn't end that way and on that note here oh no i had a paragraph ready to read and now i just messed it up here um we should sort of i know we are going on <laughs> and on here with our time so maybe we should get to step 11 here we go i just want to read this here okay it's from the 12 and 12 it is a spiritual axiom that every time we are disturbed, no matter what the cause, there is something wrong with us. If somebody hurts us and we are sore, we are in the wrong also. But are there no exceptions to this rule? What about justifiable anger? If somebody cheats us, aren't we entitled to be mad? Can't we be properly angry with self-righteous folk? For us of AA, these are dangerous exceptions. We have found that justified anger ought to be left to those better qualified to handle it. I remember my sponsor reminding me of that over and over, and I think it's a really nice way to kind of sum up the thing you said earlier about we just have to learn to just take responsibility for things and stop trying to pass it on to others. And, and that... It's a harsh reminder, but a necessary one, I think. Yeah, so steps 10 and 11 for me are very, well, 10, 11, and 12 are pretty much uh, a daily practice. Right. Uh, Let's, you know. can we read 11? Can you read sure. 11 or you want me to read it? Go ahead. You have it in, okay, I'll read it. Step 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood God, praying only for knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry that out. Yes, sir. Uh, praying only, <laughs> only for the knowledge of his will for us. You know, it took me 20 years to hear that word only in there. <laughs> I think yeah. it might be the first time I've ever heard it actually. <laughs> so yeah, so 10, 11 and 12, like I was saying, are yeah. really kind of a daily practice. Um, uh, so 10, 11, so 10 is really the, the immediate actions uh -huh. that I'm supposed to take. And then 11 are sort of like the daily, um, you know, focuses that I, that I use, um, right. you know, Can you meditate. describe some of those for us? So, yeah. you know, what a lot of, and I don't do this, you know, the way that I probably should, um, I used to, when I was pretty new to the program, I was very disciplined with doing things like, you know, but life changed and, you know, I got busier and I had less time to devote to these practices and, you know, um, you know, cause it got filled up with other stuff, right? Like when I first sobered up, I didn't work, I didn't have a job. Like I had a lot of time so I could, really invest in the spiritual and the prayer life and all that it was great and, but what a lot of long timers you know talk about um and it and i can speak of this because i have been there it's just not as diligent of a practice as it was at one time but to really spend time at the end of the day and do that nightly review of your day right and using the, the lens of step 10 and, you know, there's some key questions that it asks, you know, um, and I'll just share them with you. Yeah. So when we retire at night, we constructively review our day. Were we resentful, 
selfish, dishonest, or afraid? Do we owe an apology? Have we kept something to ourselves which should be discussed with another person at once? Were we kind and loving toward all? What could we have done better? Were we thinking of ourselves most of the time? Or were we thinking about what we could do for others or what we could pack into the stream of life? But we must be careful not to drift into worry, remorse, or morbid reflection, for that would diminish our usefulness to others. After making our review, we ask God's forgiveness and inquire what corrective measures should be taken. And then on awakening, let us think about the 24 hours ahead. We consider our plans for the day. Before we begin, we ask God to direct our thinking, especially asking that it be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, or self-seeking motives. Under these conditions, we can employ our mental faculties with assurance, for after all, God gave us brains to use. Our thought life will be placed on a much higher plane when our thinking is cleared of wrong motives. So, you know, for the most part, I do start my day every day and I ask God to direct my thinking. I start my day every day with quiet time and quiet reflection uh, with meditations. Um, I've done this pretty much since the inception of my sobriety. I, um, nowadays, I, the, the practice of having that substantial period of quiet. So I get up every morning between 5.30 and 6. I don't start work until 9.00. And I deliberately have three hours every morning so that I could have at least an hour of complete quiet. And within that hour, I have meditation practice. That's been my practice for years. And, uh, you know, I, and there are times that I don't get, like when I go and travel, when I, when I don't get the opportunity to have that sit and that quiet time. Uh, I mean, I don't get a little antsy but I do notice I feel it you know and so I don't I don't want to skimp with it um, I find the practice of reading meditation readings in the morning and then reflecting on it um, really important and it centers me it grounds me and it aligns me with God's will you know um, because as soon as I step out of my apartment and go into the world that's where all the stressors of the world happen and that's where so I find starting my day with it really grounding you know it just really grounds me a lot of long timers talk about you know having that in the morning and then at night before they go to bed but that's where i sometimes falter i don't i can't remember the last time where i've actually meditated before going to bed i'm tired you know um my days are long so usually now i could probably start this practice if i wanted to incorporate it just start my routine a little earlier so I can fit it in. That is an option. I just, I haven't done it. But I do end my day with prayer and I, I have a prayer of thanks. I kind of sort of do a quick review. I don't really ask those key questions. There are there, like whenever I study step 11 at my home group, I always think, yeah, I'd like to get back to doing that, you know? But then I don't, you know, I just kind of go to bed. And, um, but they're good. Like I, I have been there where I have done them and I do definitely get results. Um, I'm very committed to the program, you know, so it's not like I feel like I'm at a vulnerability, you know, I just kind of have my routine and my practice. I mean, it can always go deeper, you know, I mean, the spiritual life is fast and early and so that we can always take it deeper. Um, spiritual retreats are another part of my step 11, you know, where I carve out a weekend and go on a retreat and actually do it. Some people go on meditation retreats or things like that. Um, I find spiritual retreats very helpful, uh, very grounding, you know, um, what I was doing for the last few years, and they've been canceled over the pandemic, but my sobriety date is August 1st, 1998. So down in the Windsor area, there is a retreat center down there on Lake Erie, and it's always a long weekend. So it was a great way for me to kickstart my another sober year with a spiritual retreat. It's uh, gay and lesbians coming together. It's um, our focus is um, spirituality, but being gay, right? 
those two for me never really mixed for a long time. So it's nice to have a committed group of individuals that are on a spiritual journey that share that with me. So that was always really nice and hope to be able to get to that this year. You know, going to conventions, Founders Day weekend, uh, various things like that for me is another form of step 11 where I really get to experience the power of God. But the joyous sort of more um, uplifting part of it, you know, not so much in the silence, but more about feeling the connection and the energy and the synergy of the collective consciousness. That for me is very beautiful. And, and uh, you know, for me, it's really about seeking guidance, right? You know, listening and, and paying attention and, and asking, you know, the key questions, you know, of like, what is your will for me? Or bringing a specific set of questions to my higher power and sitting in the silence. I've used tools like what the Oxford groups used um, back in their day, and they call it now, like I've heard it called um, um, something steel. It's like, a, um, I can't remember, it's, it's evading me right now, but it's, it's a similar kind of practice where you have a group of individuals and you pray together for guidance you'll like read some sort of spiritual literature, then you'll go into meditation, you'll seek God's guidance, and then you'll share it with the group. And then the group will then share back their thoughts or their opinions or their reactions to your guidance. You know, it's largely based on, oh, it's called steel on steel. That's what it's called. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's a practice that the Oxford groups did before AA was around. If you ever have a chance to go to Akron, Ohio, you learn a lot about those spiritual practices that they did before there was the big book and this beautiful fellowship that's all around the world. There was a time that none of this ever existed. So, and there's something to be said about it, you know, um, where they would, you know, share their guidance and, and, and the groups that they were involved with would feed back, you know, and sort of hold you accountable. Right. And again, it, it goes down to keeping you accountable to your spiritual development and, mm. and you can take it as far as you want to go. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a, for me, a, a lot of it has to do with silence and, and getting still and, and being yeah. quiet and turning off the noise, you know, so I can hear the voice of my higher power yeah. speaks to me through all kinds of ways through one-to-one -one with sponsees through a speaker, through nature, through silence, through a movie. I mean, all kinds of, you know, if I'm just paying attention, really, if I'm yes, awake yes, enough to pay yes, attention, yes, right? Yes, yes. I'll hear I, it. I like that. Yeah. Uh, if I just pay attention, I think another way to maybe frame it is we, I love that you pointed out only, <laughs> praying yeah. only for God's will. I think we, it, it takes, we're so di disconnected from God's will, or we could just say, what is good in life in some sense, or what is of service to the well being of humanity and existence, other animals, et cetera, that it takes us the other steps. Without going through those steps, we don't know what God's will is. And I think to me, at least right now in hearing you talk, sought through prayer and meditation, et cetera, to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood God, praying only for the will, for his will. Um, but we, we start to learn what that is. And I think the simple way is it's not my own self-centered will, but we learn what that is through all the spiritual practices that we learn in the program and may learn elsewhere, of course, whether it's through therapy or mindfulness practices or other spiritual endeavors. But I think it's, it's the continual habits that we integrate into who we are and how we live our life that help us stay on the path. And it, as you, I like how you pointed out in early recovery for a lot of people, we do have more time to do the nitty gritty by the book practices 
And if we're disciplined about that, which a lot of people are, and I would be put myself in this boat as you described it, in the beginning, again, it is easier. We have more time. We're more sort of learning these things, integrating them into who we are. And then they start to become who we are. We actually start to become those practices and that way of being and living so that the training or the discipline in the beginning isn't as necessary. It's not that we don't have to act in that way, but the detailed way of practicing maybe isn't the same. And as you also said, it happens through working with sponsees or sponsors or just recovery groups and whatever. And it just becomes in some sense, a way of life and time for time's sake, we're, we must be approaching the six, seven, eight hour mark. I'm not sure how many of all these talks added up, but I'm going to read step 12. I think you think it's fair to move on to step 12. Yeah. 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 Okay. Let's do it. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. To me, the most important thing here, the word for me is the, as a result, as the result, excuse me, as the result. Whenever I'm in meetings and I hear people read it, they always say, as a result. <laughs> And I just cringe. I'm like, no, my stubbornness and need for control is like, it's not a result. It is the result of these steps. If you do, of course, as they say, you know, follow these principles and, and generally the outcome is a spiritual transformation. And I heard recently, and I've known this, but I heard it more concretely recently, spiritual transformation is the only sustained, proven, reliable tool for recovery from addiction. In psychotherapy and research, there, it's just so fascinating how that is true. It's the only reliable, proven, sustained form of recovery. I think more specifically alcoholism, but I think it's fair to included other addictions in there and that's really researchers academics the brainiacs of the world have a very difficult time accepting that because they're not the ones who can control it and it's uncomfortable and etc so it's hard to you know, measure it's impossible to measure yeah. yeah because you can't track people over a lifespan either because the other part of that i should mention is that it works for those who stick with it and that's another hard thing for people is you don't have to stick with it, in my opinion, in a 12 step context, but you have to stick with the spiritual principles you learn through the steps and apply them in other domains of your life or through other practices. But that's the thing. You can't measure it and you have to stick with it. It's not just a, I'm screwed up. I'm going to go through the steps and then I don't have to practice these things anymore. I see that happen to people all the time and they're back using in no time and they don't understand why their life is miserable anymore because they're like oh i went through the steps you know everything anyway i'm gonna stop rambling i think i'm rambling here how how is 12 step working for tw the 12th step oh. working for you tony <laughs> working uh, marvelously <coughs> excuse me um <coughs> there's you what you were saying about yeah that's true that the result right for sure it is the result absolutely and i think for me that step 12 is like there's three components to it you know there's like the the awareness of a spiritual awakening you know and trying to carry the message you know as a result of it we pass it on to others and practicing the principles in all of our affairs which I find the most challenging part of step 12 um, is the practicing of the principles in all of my affairs, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, I think I should highlight another word, you know, you pointed out the result and I would say all my affairs, right? Cause it says that all our right. affairs, <laughs> you know, and uh, all of them, right? So, you know, and I, I don't do that. 
right? I mean, I, I can choose. It's easy for me to say, say I'm doing it when I'm in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, but, you know, am I really carrying this out into the world and to, to my family and to my, you know, relationships and my work life and stuff like that? You know, that's where I find it becomes a bit of a grind sometimes, you know, especially with people that don't ascribe to this way of living, that don't want to, or are selfish, self-serving, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard, it's hard. So um, I'm very committed to the program. Like I said before, I, uh, I've sponsored a lot over the years. I continue to in pretty much all the programs that I'm in, you know, I find that the way to really learn the program more in depth is to, to pass it on to others and sort of like to teach it to others. That's how, you know, a, it makes me more accountable to the teachings of the program because I don't want to be a hypocrite. You know, I, I want to be a, a, a role model and an example, a good example, you know, so I find that that's what I need to do. So it teaches me the value of really applying what I'm learning here. Um, but like, and, and I mean, people tell me that I, I am, but I, I know there's always a part of me that thinks that, you know, I'm not just doing enough, right. That, you know, I falter, you know, and like, I think I have this thing with perfection and if I'm not doing it perfectly and somehow I'm failing and, you know, that's not true. I mean, you know, it, it's progress, not perfection. And I have to remember that. You know, as long as I stay sober and try to be of service to others, that's a really good day for an alcoholic of my variety, you know, and I have to remember that a lot of days, that just the mere fact of me not picking up a drink or a drug and being of service to others is a miraculous thing for me, <laughs> you know, because there was a time that that was impossible, you know, yeah. Yeah. and, uh, and I don't take the program lightly, you know, I know like there's a, a, a sincere earnestness about really what this thing is about you know yes. i see it take people down all the time i get the good fortune of working in an environment that caters to recovery and people that suffer from addictions and i also know that a lot of people die from this thing, that don't make it that don't take it seriously or don't want i think i think the struggle is is a lot of people really don't get step one you know enough so that they understand they're a real alcoholic that only a spiritual experience will conquer this thing you know and then to embrace the spiritual experience in its entirety in the way that we're asked to like i think a lot of us are going to skirt it who wants to do yeah. this like yeah. i was at a meeting last night and the speaker said who wants to admit complete <laughs> defeat you know who wants to do these things right like i mean as much as I enjoy what I get from the program and working with others, I don't always want to do it. You know, it's not my, you know, I mean, it's, I've been doing it for enough years that I just, I know to do it, but I don't always want to, yeah. you know, I mean, right. <laughs> so, and, you know, like in the wisdom of my, one of my first sponsors, you know, she said, you don't have to want it. You know, you don't have to want to. I didn't want to do a lot of the things that I was doing when I was out there drugging and bugging. You know, I didn't necessarily want to steal from everybody or do a lot of the demoralizing things that I felt I had to do to get, but I did them anyways, you know, <laughs> never questioned it, never questioned the disease. If it told me to do whatever I did it, never questioned it. So, you know, so I try to bring that same kind of, uh, earnestness to my program yeah. you know I mean in the beginning it was it was a bit of a grind to muster up the willingness you know because I'm and was an and can be still inherently selfish so it's not really like my go-to um all the time but I, I've been doing it long enough that it kind of is my go-to today you know and what happened recently with the pandemic taught me that that's true you know, because I hit a crisis, as most of us did, you know, when that pandemic first was announced, and we went into lockdown, that first time anything like that ever happened in the world that I knew of, and people were going crazy, you know, you went to Costco, and they were buying out the store thinking it was the end of the world. And I was pretty calm through it all. I, I mean, I had moments of like uncertainty, like when yeah, my, yeah. my, 
investments were dropping and like all of this stuff was going crazy. And, but I did what I know to do. It was to lean into the program, went through another set of steps with my sponsor. Like I just, and a day at a time, we, we got through it, you know? And so now we're almost at the end of it. I think, I'm pretty sure this is kind of looking like it's gonna wean away. Thankfully, I mean, I knew it would eventually, but, um, and I heard it said too, when I first sobered up, no matter what, if I stay sober and help others and just commit to that, I will always be okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I believe that too. I will yeah. always be okay. Yeah. You know, I'll always get food. <laughs> you can always go to a meeting and get, a, <laughs> you know, a sandwich or something, you uh -huh. know, a cup of coffee. <laughs> you know, people are gracious enough. They help, you know. But it's true, you know, and so I went through that, you know, we were, we were on the Salerno beachhead, like, you know, they talk about in, I think it's step two of the 12 and 12, where they're talking about, can, can we take the misery and monotony of war, you know, under fire? Like, can we stay sober through, through those circumstances? And for me, what happened two years ago was exactly like that. It was like, exactly like being on the Salerno beachhead. You know, it was, you know, we were in lockdown. Thank God we had Zoom. You know, I couldn't imagine going through it without it. But, you know, I know we'd get through it, you know. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's a great part of the joy that, you know, I believe my higher powers will for me largely is to be happy, joyous, and free. I think I said that in my first part of my talk. I really believe that that is the intention of our higher power. He wants for all of us is to just be with them, to be happy, joyous, and free, you know, yeah. and to be safe, you know, uh, and uh, I believe that, you know, with my heart and soul, and it doesn't mean that everything's going to be nicey-nicey, I had a lot of delusions around that, about what, you know, God's will, like, a, you know, we call them cognitive distortions in the therapeutic world, and, yeah. you know, so that's kind of worked itself out over, over time, and, you know, for me, I really believe in, in, in really what we do in AA is largely we break self-centeredness. You know, that is the main root of the yeah. problem, yeah. you know, yeah. and I believe that. And so the steps in their design are steps to take me out of self-centeredness and out of fear and out of selfishness. And, you know, and with that, it brings a reprieve, a calm. You know, we call it God. It's just a word right, to describe right, this right. supernatural thing that's hard to measure. It's hard to, it's like you said earlier, it's like we wish the therapeutic models would embrace it more, but it's hard to measure. Like, that's the thing. Like, how do you measure spirituality? And, you know, it's difficult. And we live in an age that that's what we want to do. It's how, it, how it's done, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, and just, I... Are you, how are you doing? Do you have another five minutes or do you need yeah, to go? Yeah, I just, yeah, you're good. Yeah. Okay, cool. I just want to read something just before Please. I close my part. Please. It's in the first part of working with others. And it says that practical experience, it begins this, it says practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. It works when other activities fail. This is our 12th suggestion. Carry this message to other alcoholics. You can help when no one else can. You can secure their confidence. Sorry. Okay. Um, you can secure their confidence when others fail. Remember, they are very ill. Life will take on new meaning to watch people recover, to see them help others, to watch loneliness vanish, to see a fellowship grow about you, to have a host of friends. This is an experience you must not miss. We know you will not want to miss it. Frequent contact with newcomers and with each other is the bright spot of our lives. That's all I wanted to share on that one. You know, and I, I think know, it kind of so thumbs nice. up yeah. the 12th step, you know. And what I'm glad did. you read it because we, I just wanted to make sure we clarify the part of being of service to others i think that's sort of the a very important part of the whole program our continued spiritual well-being and just our general sense of 
sanity, I guess. There, I, I love the saying, I think it, I heard it in AA, I'm not sure, but we can't keep what we don't freely give away. And that's this, what's so nice about this is that we, you often hear the slogan in some sense or the saying that the sponsor gets more out of it than the sponsee, but it just this idea that we grow and learn and strengthen our own well-being through the practice of giving it to others freely without intention without any self-centeredness and that sort of completes the cycle and i think the last thing i did i wanted to read the promises and then maybe uh just if you have anything else to add after that we can go from there although i always I never know where the promises start because I always read it from the book. But anyway, I'm going to read it here. The spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it. Unless one's family expresses a desire to live upon spiritual principles, we think we ought not to urge them. We should not talk incessantly to them about spiritual matters. They will change in time. Our behavior will convince them more than our words. We must remember that 10 or 20 years of drunkenness would make a skeptic out of anyone. There may be some wrongs we can never fully right. We don't worry about them if we can honestly say to ourselves that we would write them if we could. Some people cannot be seen. We send them an honest letter and there may be a valid reason for postponement in some cases, but we don't delay if it can be avoided. We should be sensible tactful, considerate, and humble without being servile or scraping. As God's people, we stand on our feet. This part always makes me choke up. As God's people, we stand on our feet. We don't crawl before anyone. If we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. We are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret, we will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and economic and of economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Are these extravagant promises? We think not. They are being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly they will always materialize if we work for them work <laughs> work yeah it's true uh, yeah. it is true oh thanks so, like, yeah it's like you know yeah. grow god shrink self grow god, <laughs> you know? yeah yeah oh but yeah well, no thank you tony for all this and i think if we have the patience and willingness we'll go through the traditions too Oh, I'd be, be yeah. a pleasure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll do that obviously another time. And, yeah. but yeah, thank you so much for, for all of this and anything you kind of want to add as a last note. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to just add at something that I stumbled across in, in alignment with your reading of the promises. Um, I heard these spoken somewhere. They're called the 12 rewards. Again, it's the same sort of like idea of, of the uh, 12 promises, but these are more like they call right. them rewards. I like to share them. So uh, one, hope instead of desperation. Two, faith instead of despair. Three, courage instead of fear. Four, peace of mind instead of confusion. Five, self-respect instead of self-contempt. Six, self-confidence instead of helplessness. Seven, the respect of others instead of their pity and contempt. Eight, a clean conscience instead of a sense of guilt. 
Nine, real friendships instead of loneliness. 10, a clean pattern of life instead of a purposeless existence. 11, the love and understanding of our families instead of their doubts and fears. And 12, the freedom of a happy life instead of the bondage of an alcoholic obsession. I always uh, like to share yeah. those because uh, they're not really, I don't, I heard them one time, but I thought, oh, I like those, but you never hear them, right? Yeah. I mean, they're, not, yeah. they're not taken out of the big books. So I think most groups can just kind of, I think this was somebody made them up, but I think it's kind of true, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, so beautiful. But anyhow, thank it's you, been Tony. A, my yeah. pleasure, and uh, yeah. thanks again for asking me, Mike. And uh, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll be back with more do. on the yeah. We'll Absolutely. be back. We'll be back with more on the principles or the traditions. But yeah, thanks again, yeah. Tony. And you know, they all have a principle, right? So yes, yes. Looking true, forward true. to getting into that. Yeah. Okay.